Hello, I am Reverend Irene Smith, and I'd like to welcome you to Generationally Speaking. Here at the table, we come and we discuss life issues, no matter what they might be. As we sit at the table with each generation, we all learn, we all grow, we all are inspired. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Generationally speaking. Hello, I am Reverend Irene Smith, and I want to welcome you to Generationally Speaking. Uh, where we bring all the generations to the table and we discuss life issues with the bottom line being the Word of God. Well, I am always excited uh, to have my guests with me. I know you're looking around and you're asking yourself, where is Minister Durham and where is Pastor Shamika? Well, today I'm out here by myself, but trust me, they're not too far away. So I want to welcome you. I am on site. I'm here in Washington, D.C., and I am excited, as always, to uh, invite to the table and to our conversation uh, Charles Chuck Hicks. Man, you're talking about history maker. This man is a history maker. It's one thing to sit at the table with somebody who has written a book about something they've learned, but today our guest He's actually written the book. <laughs> he is the book. He, this is his journey, and I wanted to share it with you. When we think about the Bible, and we think about um, Israel, and the children of, uh, of, of Israel, how did they get their history? Their history came through oral, telling the story over and over and over, so that the young people would know their history. Here we are today, and we're giving you the opportunity to bring to the table all your young pe peeps, you know, them young children, and let them hear their story. It is so rich, and I'm telling you, you will be blessed. So, um, Mr. Hicks, yes. I want to say welcome. Thank you so much. I'm excited about having you here and just to let people know um, a little bit about who you are. Um, you are the founder uh, and director of the D.C. Black History Celebration Committee, but before all of that came about, I saw a documentary from the Library of Congress about your family. And it was such a blessing. So I want to take this time to allow you to introduce your father to us and his activism, even in his time. So share with us a little bit of that. Well, it's interesting because I guess we started off as long as I can remember, we, as a family, we did everything together. Uh, we went to church together. My parents were relatively young. Uh, my mom and dad had me when they were 16. And so we had a young family and we could do things together. So it, we did picnics, we go fishing, we played slow motion football, we went to church together, we had family prayer. And my parents had a, particularly my mother, had this idea that uh, we could be anything and do anything we wanted to do. And, and so she was the push behind the whole family. Uh, she encouraged my dad to, my dad was really good with his hand. He could build things, he could make things. My dad built uh, our house, he wired it when we uh, moved to, from one house to another. He could just do a lot of good things. Uh, and so I remember growing up and we would have Christmas speeches and Easter speeches <laughs> and I would maybe do instead of one I'd do three <laughs> but whatever I did my dad would say that was good my mother would say oh why didn't you do it this way or why didn't you put some feeling in this part I mean we used to say my dad was easy. If we say boo, 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 it was wonderful. If my mother said, she said, you should have said boo, boo, boo. <laughs> and so she pushed us beyond what we thought we were doing, that you could do better. I expect more. Just because you can do it, doesn't mean that it's the best you can do. Uh, and so we grew up in a family like that. Uh, we did things together on 4th of July. Uh, we just, well, family. 
And so it, it started with us being a family. And one of the interesting things about us being a family, I think that particularly going, growing up in a small southern town, and Bogalusa was an interesting place because we were not a farm town. We had a factory there, mm -hmm. uh, the paper mill and the box factory. So in one sense, there was a somewhat of a black mill class uh, that my dad worked at the factory, so he made a fairly decent living. And then uh, so people with insurance people and teachers and uh, dentists and even people, business people. And but one of the things that was interesting about growing up as a Hicks is that my parents didn't mind us being disciplined when we went to school, but my mother was not going to allow us to be mistreated. So we got to the point where everybody wanted a Hicks kid in their class because they wanted to show what they could do to a Hicks kid. Wow! And uh, my mother, didn't, my mother wouldn't tolerate it. I remember one time, uh, I was supposed to have been in about fifth grade, and we were, at the, we were in line for a, they were giving milk away for two cents or something like that. And it was a long line and people were shoving. And this lady pulled me out of the line and said, stop pushing and shoving, you're acting like a nigger. I said, my mom would say, nobody calls me a nigger. And I ran out, I ran out of the schoolyard and ran home and the teacher was running after me and I cut the rallies. I went home and told my mother the teacher called me a nigger. My mother got up and I was very, very pretty. Dressed herself up and went down. She knew the principal there. And she said, nobody, nobody will mistreat my children. Now if they do something wrong, they could be disciplined. But nobody, she said, I want to see her. She's a big lady. She came in my mother and said, don't you ever call my son a nigga, none of my children. She said, just because you all are teachers so me, you, you know everything. I raised my children, they're obedient, but you're not going to mistreat them. So we grew up with a label that everybody wanted to get a Hicks kid. And one of, the, one of the things also was about being a Hicks kid. Everybody wanted to be in a class of a Hicks kid because when we were growing up, we were poor. And so when we went to school at lunch, at recess, we, my mother didn't have money to give us a dime or a quarter or a nickel, so she baked cookies for us every day. And so we had a whole bunch of cookies. And so we could take cookies together to school, and I sell mine. <laughs> you know, I could take 25 cookies and sell them for a, a penny a piece or something like that. So I could make 10 cents or 15 cents, and I still had 10 cookies uh, to share with my friend. And then I could go to the, the little session stand and buy me a baby roof or whatever I wanted to. And so all the time we had, my mother made dessert cookies for us to take to school. But then one of the things she always said that if you were in the Hitch Kid class, every Christmas she made a batch of cookies mm -hmm. for the whole class. For Easter she made an Easter rabbit. Uh, something in the spring she brought cookies. And so if you were in a Hicks class, kids class, you got this. And she didn't bring one box, she brought a big <coughs> box. So every kid could get two or three cookies. So a lady, one of my <laughs> sister's classmates said, everybody wants to be in one of the Hicks kids class because they knew about them oatmeal cookies and their mother cookies. And so it was a, kind of like a two-edged sword there. We were liked and then we were a challenge and because my mother, you know, so oftentimes in small towns like that, if a teacher said something, a lot of the parents who had limited education were afraid to confront right. a teacher. Right. And so we started off in a lot of ways in a marked family. Uh, and the teachers, and, but my dad and my mom were going to school with a lot of these teachers, right, and they right. knew them. Right. Uh, though they were not teachers, they were workers, you know, but we had a, my dad earned a decent living. Uh, we were in a decent church. We had a, a car. We were one of the first, I remember when we moved to Avenue W, we were, we were moving we had grown up in an alley in the back of a, uh, uh, a street and it was the alley and we had grown up there with three other houses. So when we moved from alley to Avenue W, I remember my brother gave my daddy a, a nickel and said, <laughs> Daddy, buy us a TV. 
America. When we well. moved on Avenue W, my dad had bought us a TV. And we were the only people in, at that point who had a TV in that, in, in that neighborhood. And so people would come to our house to watch TV. And what was so interesting that people came in different groves. The men came to watch the fights. Uh, the women came for something else. The kid came for the talent shows. And they came, they watched the TVs, they watched the fight, and then they got up and they went home. And we never had cookies. And you know, now if somebody comes to your house to watch something, you got to have a, a tray. If you don't have something to eat for, you know, what's going on here? But it was very, very interesting because people respected your privacy to, and they respected you. And they didn't come, to, you didn't have to tell anybody, well, we're going to bed now. Because they came to see something and then they got up and they left. And so we were always uh, kind of looked at from two different perspectives. Uh, we were a family that was an ordinary family, uh, but we were extraordinary children. My parents pushed us and we did well. Uh, so how did your father move into this activist role? Um, well, I, I think that my dad had been really kind of a leader even in high school. Uh, one time we gave my dad a birthday party and uh, a lot of his classmates came and they started talking about that my dad was, when he played football and all that, he was a leader. Uh, and that even in his class he was a leader. And so one, when the movement started, uh, and we, people used to say in the South that, it, well, if it's not here for us yet, it's coming. Mm -hmm. And at one point, the <coughs> core came to Bogalusa. And our family, uh, they, were, we want, they wanted to do some integration there. Mm -hmm. And one of the first things that happened was that, uh, that we, we had three civil rights workers to come, two whites and one black, and nobody wanted to keep them. And so we, they stayed at our house. We had a, a nice house house. We had three bedrooms, the boys' room, the girls' room, and my parents' room. And so my dad you know, took my sister's room and, and let them stay in it and move my two sisters. We had a, a den and a, a, a base, uh, a rec, a rec room. And so they stayed down there. And it started off, my dad was part of the NAACP. Okay. And what happened was that uh, one of the guys who had been treasurer of the NAACP came in and, uh, and left or passed away or something. So the president of the NAACP asked my dad, said, Mr. Hicks, you a bright man and uh, intelligent. We need a treasurer. Why don't you come be the treasurer? And my dad said, I don't know. You know, I don't want to really. And they said, you don't have much to do. And so my dad started off in the NAACP. Mm -hmm. But as the movement grew, uh, the NAACP was not moving at the speed that a lot of the young people wanted. And so they eventually planned a march. And when that march started, uh, it was young people. And so uh, they had to compensate the young people. So the NAACP eventually said, well, we're not going to do it that way. And they made a, uh, an agreement with the mayor uh, that they would have some days of testing, a day of testing. You could go to these restaurants. Uh, maybe they let you eat and stuff, and it would be over. But it didn't turn out to be a good day. And so the NAAC basically dropped out. And through that group, they formed a, a group called the D.C. Voters, Bogalusa Voters League. And that was the, group, the league that ran the Civil Rights Movement. Uh, the Deacons came later, and the Deacons' role was to protect uh, people in the Civil Rights Movement. And the Deacons actually started in Jonesboro, Louisiana. We started the first chapter of uh, the Deacons, and it was formed on Malcolm X's birthday. So let's stop right there because uh -huh. a lot of times we hear uh, these terms and we don't fully uh, 
understand all of it. So your dad uh, was tapped to uh, be a leader uh, in, the, in this movement in Bugalusa. Yeah. And uh, as a result, he was pivoted almost to the front of the line to say you're the, you're the face of, of, of this, 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 this movement a lot because people knew him, respected him, respected his family. And there he was in the center of, 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 of the movement. But then you had what they called the deacons. These were not deacons like no. we know them today, no. deacons in the church. No. But the deacons, and uh, I, I think that that's a part of our history that we need to expand a little bit about. So tell us about the, the term, the deacons. When you call the deacons, who were you, what were you well, calling on? The deacons uh, for the defense was formed in Greensboro, uh, Louisiana. And it, was, it started out a group of men who had been in the military, mm -hmm. been in the war, uh, and come back. And they couldn't get any protection for the civil rights movement and things that were happening in Jonesboro. So these were men who had military training. And so they set up uh, men and they had walkie-talkies and they patrolled their neighborhoods. And some of the men were deacons in that church, not all of them. Mm -hmm. And some of them were men who worked in factories on the farms or whatever. And so they formed this group and called it the deacons. Uh, but it was not primarily men from the church. There were right. some, but that was maybe that was just a name that caught, mm -hmm. uh, and it gave them some credibility. Uh, and so, the deacons first formed in Greensboro, uh, North Carolina, and Bogalusa. The first chapter was formed in Bogalusa, and one of the things that happened was that after they had, I was talking about that march. And one of the, uh, the, when we went and did the ta days of testing, and days of testing was that when you went and integrated the restaurants mm -hmm. or the uh, places to eat and stuff like that, the Walmart or the Bob and Dime store, or the little cafe, white cafe and stuff, and they wouldn't serve you or they throw water on you and all that sort of stuff, but it did not turn out well. And so they planned to do another march. And at some point, uh, the chief of police came down because we had the civil rights workers there. And because we had two white guys and a, a black guy there, everybody in Bogalusa knew, white and black, that we were housing these civil rights workers. If they had been all black, you could have said, well, those are our cousins from California, <laughs> from Chicago, but that would not know. And one of the reasons that people were afraid to house the civil rights workers initially because if you work for Miss Smith and she right. found out that you had to, you lost your job, one of the consequences was for us in the civil rights movement as a family, and we were, our house was like a YMCA. Uh, we were a center where kids came. We had one of the first uh, set of encyclopedias in our side of town, and especially for a working class family. Teachers and maybe the insurance people had them but working class people did what we did. And my mother bought these Funk and Wagner encyclopedias for maybe a quarter or 50 cents a piece uh, from the A&P. They sold them on a, and so that's how we bought right. We had a set of encyclopedias. But one of the things that happened during the movement, like I said, our house was the center. Uh, we, got a, we played basketball and uh, we come to our house and after school, whatever we had, whatever we were served, you could have too. And during the movement, one of the things that began to happen was we lost a lot of friends because people would tell their children, I don't want you going back down to the Hicks family's house anymore because I don't want to lose my job. And so one of the downsides about being in this movement was that there were sacrifices, mm -hmm. a lot of different sacrifices. So we had these civil rights workers standing in our house. And that, after they had had a day or two of that testing, the chief of police came down one evening and told my dad that a mob was forming of 250 white men. They were coming to our house to lynch us and to burn the house down. And uh, he said, I'm here to get these civil rights workers out of your house and take them out. Uh, to New Orleans to get him out of Bogalusa. And my mother was the first one who said no. I later asked my mother, why did you say no? 
She said, because I'm a mother and I couldn't imagine anybody doing that to my sons. And also that was a sign that the Shaney Goodman and Swartz had been killed in that found little boy's body. Mm -hmm. And my mother and them knew that if the police had taken them out, they never would have come out alive. And so when that happened, uh, my dad asked, her, she said, well, you're the policeman. He said, first of all, he said, this is my house, I own it. There's no law that says I can't have them in my house. So we asked him, he said, do you all want to stay? They said, yes. He said, they don't have to leave. He said, are you going to give us some protection? He said, nope. I don't have, I got 35,000 other citizens, black, whites, and negroes to protect. I don't have time to be fooling with poor white trash. And so uh, he said, my dad said, you're not giving us protection? He said, no. He said, well, I'll get my own protection. And by that time, they had this uh, Bogalusa Voter City here for him. So my dad told my sister, call AZ, call Albert, Fred Crumley, and Roy, and tell them that we need some protection. And my sister got on the phone and told, call and tell them what was happening. They needed them to come and call each one, tell, tell their wives, call the neighbors. And so people start calling people. And at some point, there had to be 50 guys in our house, on the roof, and on neighbors' porches. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that was interesting is that eventually they turned off all the phones in that section of the, in Bogalus, all the black phones in the neighborhood. But as the word got out, we were, if our house was here, there was a road here that came to our house. And so they blocked that road off, police cars. And so people came through streets and other people's houses, they came through fields, mm. and they and so they, they had other ways, they came through other people's houses to get to our house. Mm. And they were on the roof, they was in trees, they were in neighbors' houses. And so, needless to say, the mob never came. Mm -hmm. But at one point doing all of this, um, after the police left, the chief of police left, my mom, my dad turned to my mom and said, what are we gonna do? My dad said, if you had asked him what he thought could be the worst situation in terms of being in the movie, that he never would have, could have conceived that this could have been happening. So my mother said, I just want to get, say we're not leaving, but I want to get my children out. Mm -hmm. So the first car that came and we had a garage with an opening in the back, we didn't, it wasn't closed in. Right. So the first car that came, a guy named Fred Crumley. Uh, my mother and dad called us together and told us, I wasn't here actually, I was in Southern by that time, but told my brothers and sisters that they were doing this and they might not ever see them again, but they wanted them to know why they were doing it. That this was time for a change to make life better for them, for everybody. And if they never saw them again, to know why they did it for them and other black people. And so they drove my brothers and sisters uh, to a friend's house, to Fred's house. And for three days, the phones were cut off. Uh, and even when the phones came back on, they were tapped. And so you know, they couldn't call my mother and them, couldn't call them, and, they, and Fred and them couldn't call my mother because then they know. And so my brothers and my sisters went through three days of just torture, mm -hmm. just thinking my folks had been killed. Mm -hmm. And they had no communication because nobody could call because the phone was capped. And if they knew where they were, then the police, the people would have called the police, mm -hmm. the, the, the mob would have come in, and my brother and sister could have been killed. And so that was part of how, how the these got started. So when uh, the chief of police, before they got the, the phone got turned out, they were able to get a call out to Corey New Orleans and told them what was happening and if they, they needed to put it on the APY mm -hmm. and the UPSY. And the word went out. And so by the time 6 o'clock in the morning came, there were all kinds of reporters. And they saw all these black men on the roof, in trees, in the house, on people's house. And they asked my dad, who are these men? He said, they're the deacons for defense. 
<laughs> and, the, and the New York Times, the Los Angeles Times, Atlanta's paper, all the national papers picked it up. And so the deacons got to be thought of from Bogalusa. And we always say that the deacons started in Jonesboro, Louisiana, with a group of men who had been in the military, were not getting the protections that they needed in the civil rights movement. So they created a group mm -hmm. to protect. And it was, a, it was a, the deacons were a nonviolent self-protection group. Mm -hmm. uh, and so when they went out all over the news nationally, and there were pictures, uh, the people learned the deacons, they think of the deacons and they think of Bogalusa. And throughout the whole movement, Bogalusa got most of the notoriety with the deacons. So that's how the deacons got started. Uh, and oftentimes I say that there were two sets of deacons. There were the deacons who guarded, and one of the things that during this time we became a marked family. And so we could go nowhere. Uh, we, if we went, we couldn't even go visit friends or go play at people's houses or visit because we were marked. And so every place we met, we went. The deacons had to take us. Wow. Uh, and I remember one time my brother didn't come home from school and he went over to a friend's house. And when he didn't come home from school, it was an alert. <coughs> And they had walkie-talkies wow. and they had all this sort of stuff and they put these codes out and they were searching for my brother. And at one point you saw him walking down the street. <laughs> and of course everybody was along and said, Rob, where'd you go? He said, I went to so-and-so. You know, uh, but that was the kind of life we lived. Uh, uh, a whole life change yeah. because we've been a family. Well, for an example, every day for at dinner, we all had dinner together. We sat down and we had dinner, and my mom said, well, what did you all do today? Or what happened today? And of course, I was the oldest and my sister was next to me. And if I had done something, my sister told what I had done. <laughs> and so, which, which set me up for punishment of some time, some time. Uh, but we did that. We were one of the few families, uh, black families, who functioned as a family. So we did a lot of things together. And so when my parents got involved in the movement, we automatically knew that we were involved in it because we did nothing without each other. And so we were automatically involved in the movement. Uh, when they got to integrating the schools, uh, my dad said, okay, I'll, uh, Greg will do it and Pina will do it, my youngest sister. And one day I asked, my brother and them, I said, Greg, when you all integrated to school, did daddy and them talk to you about it or ask you? He said, no. He just said, you're going to integrate Bogus High. And that was it. That was it. <laughs> <laughs>